千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. In 52, as we get into it, you will find that it continues many of the themes we've been studying in the previous chapters. Probably the most prominent, most noticeable, is that we will see the life-affirming side, the nurturing side of the Tao, described as being like a mother. And indeed, this is something that we can see in the Chinese su su、uh, subtitle, or I should say, the chapter title of chapter 52. Let me share with you what that is. So one thing that I haven't talked about、uh, in the years past is that every chapter comes with a title, and there are variations sometimes in the titles as well. In this particular chapter, in 52, there are actually two titles that are possible that one can possibly encounter. Now, for whatever reason, the vast majority of translation out there do not include any reference to the Chinese、uh, chapter titles. So I also did not include them when I created my translation.、Uh, but it always seemed to me that if we talk about it, it can set the stage, so to speak, for what the chapter is going to be about. That is certainly true. To this particular chapter, it has a title, as you can see here, "Hold to the Mother." That sounds a little bit odd to Western ears. In the Chinese, what you see right below, "Shou Mu Zhang." Literally, the first character is "Hold to," to hold on to. The second character, the character in the middle, literally, that is "Mother." No, no real alternative ways to translate that. It's just mother. And then the last character there, the character to the rightmost character, that's just the character for chapter. So again, not a whole lot of different ways to translate that. What is the meaning when we say "hold to the mother"? Well, as we talked about、uh, just a, a slide back, the Tao. Has a nurturing, life-affirming aspect to it, and that is often referred to as the mother, mother of everything, mother of existence, mother of reality, the universe, you name it. So, mother is actually synonymous for the Tao, even though the Tao itself is genderless. You know, it's not male or female.、Um, It encompasses all possible genders, male or female.、Uh, it itself is genderless. We refer it. We、uh, we talk about it as the mother only because that is the closest approximation that the human mind can come up with. So, hold to the mother. It just means to hold to the Tao. If you prefer, you might say holding on to the Tao. So Tao in this context is the source of life. What would be the children of this mother? We're going to get into that. One aspect of the mother-children relationship is to think of the children of the Tao as the myriad things. So that includes us, but it is not the entire scope. We're going to talk about the full scope. After we take a look at the chapter itself, as usual, we're gonna look at the chapter, reading it from beginning to end. Tao Te Ching, Chapter Fifty Two. The world has a beginning. We regard it as the mother of the world. 
having its mother, we can know her children. Knowing her children, still holding on to the mother, live without danger all through life. Close the mouth, shut the doors, live without toil all through life. Open the mouth, meddle in the affairs, live without salvation all through life. Seeing details is called clarity. Holding on to the soft is called strength. Utilize the light, return to the clarity, leaving no disasters for the self. This is called practicing constancy. That is the translated text of the original 52. Now, as we're looking at both the Chinese to the left, the English to the right, we can begin to look for some repeating patterns to discern the hidden structure of chapter 52. Like all other chapters, this one is also divided into sections. Although just looking at the English translation, the divisions may not be immediately obvious as to where they should be. It's a little bit easier when we look at the original Chinese characters. Even for those who cannot read Chinese, we can still pick out the similar graphical representations, the similarities visually of the characters. So let me illustrate what I mean. As we scan from the first line downward, you should be able to pick out some similar characters that reiterate from line to line. In the same position, the same character recurring in the same position, and oftentimes the lines are the same length. As you look at the, the English and the Chinese side by side, you should be able to see the following. So the first obvious iteration goes from line three to line six. As you can see there, there is a, a third character that's repeating itself. Now, oftentimes, Chinese is contextual, which means that the meaning can change depending on the characters around it. Now, it can change not in arbitrary ways, but in very specific ways. As I have said before, many characters, expressions in Chinese are gender neutral, and you don't know while it's being used what the gender ought to be. And it's no different in English. If I say teacher, well, that's not really giving a clue as to the gender of the teacher. Whereas if I say in English, mother, then it's pretty obvious that the gender must be female. So an, an expression similar to teacher, like master, that in itself is also gender neutral. You will not be able to figure out one way or the other until you have more context. Here we have a we have a, a character that can be translated as its, her, his, their, or the. Here you see some of those possibilities highlighted in the English translation. In line three, its, and then line four, her, because it's referring to the mother. Same thing with line five, and then and then the last one, line six there, translated as the, but it can also be translated as there because it's a reference to the children, the mother of the children. So just wanted to make sure everyone knows that there are times when the same character is translated differently depending on the context. So now let's take a look at the meaning here 
we start out in the beginning talking about talking about the world has a beginning you can say the world has an origin the world has a source beginning source origin would also would all be acceptable translations of the very last character of line one the fourth character there so we're talking about this source this beginning this starting point this origin as the mother whatever is giving rise to the child is the mother then we then go on from line three to line six talking about the mother and then the mother children dynamic then in line seven we're coming upon a conclusion of this section of the Tao Te Ching, the first section and it says live without danger all through life we're gonna dig into the details of that line when we do the line by line explanation for now though notice how between line seven and line eight there is a distinct break in tone from line eight onward it's talking about something different close the mouth shut the door live without toil etc and then following that open the mouth meddle in the affairs live without salvation etc so it seems logical it seems reasonable i'm sure you would agree that we want to have a dividing line this shows that we have lines one to seven seven lines talking about the Tao as the mother that if you hold on to the mother that if you hold on to the Tao you live without danger all through life and we'll talk about what that means let's continue on with the sectional analysis to see if we can figure out where another section ought to be so still looking at the same character that was highlighted T, we can scan further down and we definitely see that it is also reiterating in the section below but in a different position and the lines are different lengths so lines 8 9 11 and 12 they're all three characters long whereas 3 4 5 6 they're all four characters long now for 8, 9, 11, and 12, it's the same character that is in the middle. And here, it is translated as the, and that is because there is no clear indication what its, their, her, his will be applicable. Therefore, the generic the is fine. And the English word the itself can be rather versatile, that it allows us the flexibility to apply these statements to different contexts like you, me, other people, everybody. So that will become clear momentarily. But now, though, I want to point out, I think everyone may be able to see this. 8, 9, 10, three lines, and 11, 12, 13, three lines. These two match. Can you see that they match as two subsections of the second section? Let me show you. What I've done here is that I've circled three characters that reiterate from 10 to 13. And you can see the translation highlighted to the right. And this is one case where the syntax of ancient Chinese is dramatically different from modern English. So you have to shift around a little bit to have a sentence that makes sense. So here, specifically, the first two characters would be the, at the very end, all through life, followed by Bu, the negation character. So it is more tricky than usual to make sense of that particular line, but basically it's talking about how you live through your life until the end of it, 
So where it says Zhongshen, that is actually the first two characters actually depict you've lived through the entire life and now you're at the end of it. So the two characters together depict the totality of your life or a lifetime, a single lifetime. You go through your life without something. So you can construct it that way. You can possibly construct it that way in English as well. You, you can literally say, live through all, all of your life without toil. And that would be an acceptable way to translate line 10. In a similar way, you can say, live through your entire life without salvation. That would also be acceptable for line 13. The bottom line, though, is that when we compare them like this, 10 to 13, 10 matches with 13, line 9 matches with line 12, line 8 matches with line 11. We actually have a section here that is composed of two subsections. Uh, and the subsections, as you can see, are three lines each. So that's most of the, the iterations. There is just one last section left. By default, it is section three, the third section. And I think you can already see line 14 and 15 contain an iterated character. And they're translated as called. It is called something. Then after that, there is not a whole lot of repetition, mostly because the last section is used as conclusion for the whole thing. Then at the very end, we get to this concept. Xi Chang, practicing constancy. When we get to the end, we're going to need to spend some time to talk about exactly what that means. But now, though, we have our three sections. We can see the structure, you know, with this highlighting, and we're ready to talk about the line by line explanation, starting with the first line. So, first of all, the very first line says the world as a beginning. As I mentioned, the character for beginning can be starting point, source, origin, etc. So the meaning is that the world is alive. It's a living thing. Now, let's go a little bit further into the translation and the explanation to talk about how this makes sense. First of all, let's keep in mind that in ancient times, the ancient sages did not have science as we understand science today. Therefore, lacking the scientific method, the scientific thought process, the ancients did not know exactly how the world began. They could intuitively, they could reason their way to the conclusion that well, everything has a beginning. We we'll look around the world, everything we observe has some kind of beginning. So the world must have had a beginning at some point. We don't know when, but there was a beginning for sure. So that's, that's the first step in the realization about the origin of the world. Not knowing exactly what it is, they can nevertheless point to it and say that when we look at all living things and they have their beginning, they all come from the mother. Human beings as infants are born of the mother. Animals, the same. Even plants have a parent tree that gives rise to a child tree, so to speak. It reproduces in a way. So there must be a beginning, and without knowing what that beginning is, we can simply 
assign it, regard it, label it as the mother, mother of the world. That's line two. So let me uh, point out some characters here. The, the third and fourth characters, that's Tianxia. That means all under heaven. That means the world. And then the last character is the character for mother. So to say Tianxia Mu means the mother of the world. So here, the main point is that the beginning, that's the last character of line one, is thought of as the mother. That's the last character of line two. And you're going to see this idea repeated again and again, and it will be applied to everything. So here we are. Creation of the world is equated to the birth of a living thing. And this could be puppy, kitten, baby, human baby, etc. Now, today, when we look at this from modern perspective, we definitely have a lot more knowledge and ideas about the world as a living, breathing entity. So with the benefit of science in modern times, we see the world as a living thing. It's got many of the characteristics of the living things, so we can definitely see where the ancients were driving at, but let's explore their thought process a little bit more. Remember, the ancients are now pointing at the world, saying it's alive, therefore it must have been born once upon a time. So where does that take us in terms of our thinking process? Line three, having its mother. So here, I want to take a step back and remind everyone about the sense of wonder, the awe that human beings all experience, no matter who you are, no matter what your background, when you think about, regard, or witness the birthing process, you cannot help but see it as a miracle of life. So this is very common throughout all cultures of the world, East or West, ancient times or now. The birthing process of an infant coming into this world, that's a miracle of life. Now, take a moment to apply this miracle to the creation of the world. Apply this to the world, conclusion, well, the creation of the world, like the birth of an infant, it's no less miraculous. It's a miracle of creation. It's like the birth. Therefore, think about when you witness a baby being born, an infant, coming into the world, being welcomed into the world. The world being a living thing, when the world is created in the universe, that's like a newborn baby being born. And this is why the genderless Tao is referred to as the mother. Now, think about how when the baby is born, it's ready to learn and grow. It already has the genetic imprints, a blueprint on its growth and development. You know, much of our lives have uh, a factor that is genetically determined. You know, how tall you're going to grow, your hair color, and physical manifestations. You are also born with a mind. That is, you've got de developing intelligence and consciousness, which you can use to deal with the world, to learn from the world, to get better at coping with the world, master the world. Therefore, the infant, we can say, when he or she is born, when a baby is born, the baby already comes with everything that is needed for continuous change and development. Now, apply that to the world. That says, the world upon creation, it comes with everything it needs for continuous change and development. We find that 
to be even more true today than we did before. The more we know about the world, the more we learn about science, the more we see how true this is. So in this paradigm, I want everyone to pay attention to the fact that the Tao is never described as a designer or architect. So this is a major difference between the Tao and Western conceptions of creation. Of course, we in the West oftentimes come across references of God as the great architect who plans, designs, and builds the world. When we delve into the Tao, we see, no, not planned, not designed, not built, but given birth. Now, one of the things that this implies is that it can be a better fit. When you think about the difference between mother and craftsman, you know, the birth is, uh, is a strange thing. It's literally a miracle because, I mean, once upon a time, we know that in the universe, there were no human beings. So while I can, I can confidently say that, you know, my mom gave birth to me. She, in turn, was given life from my grandparents, my grandmother on the maternal side. And then this goes back as many generations as I care to investigate. I can keep going back for literally millions of years. But then at some point, I get to a place where human beings do not exist in this world. I go back further, and then I get to a point where even the world, Earth, did not exist. So then where would be the mother? Well, the mother would then have to be nothingness. So ultimately, everything came out of the void of nothingness in that paradigm. Whereas in construction, when you design, plan, and build something, notice that it's built from raw material. You end up with a finished product, and you've got some leftover raw material. That's different. In construction, you start with something, you end with something, you know, the finished product. In the birthing process, you start with nothing you end up with something or someone. So be mindful of the difference. Now let's explore this thought process a little bit further. I have some ways to summarize how it was in ancient times. This is how the ancient sages looked at it without the benefit of modern science. So first of all, they noted all living things were born. That's the character for the Tao that you see here. And it just means that whatever it was that served as the source of everything, we'll call it the Tao because continuous creation seems to be the universal way and Tao is the way. They were born, all things were born and they grew. They grew by virtue of being alive. Hence, the character to use there is de, that's the character for virtue. So by virtue of being alive, I'm talking about the life force that drives all living things to learn, develop, grow, etc. It's a difficult way to describe that because we don't really have the appropriate words to describe you know, this life force this, you know, by virtue of, um, by the power of, we don't have the great words to describe it in a very accurate way. So now the ancient sages looked at all living things, realized that Tao De, the source, the virtue, the Tao and the virtue were intimately involved in the creation of all things. Now they knew that human beings were part of the myriad of things that we're living things too, we're animals. So in some ways, we're no different. Now, in addition to what we share, 
with other living things. Human beings have the unique human consciousness. That is, we have the capacity to learn and grow mentally. We can improve ourselves. Okay, so now the question is this. We're still, we're still talking about the thought process of the ancients. Living things can learn, living things can develop and grow because they were born of the mother, the Tao. Human beings the same, but human beings mentally can learn and grow. So what is the source of the human mind? Human mind must have also been given rise to, must have been produced, created, sourced, originated at a starting point. What is that? Well, again, we have no idea, but we can give it the label Tao. So here's a depiction. The ancients realized that human beings could learn. Human beings could communicate with one another. They can discuss their ideas. They can play games. They can develop strategies. They can apply those strategies not only to the games, but also to different life situations. They can contemplate, reflect, consider different things in life, you know, by themselves. So mentally, the mind, the sentience, human consciousness, that too is something that can grow and develop. Therefore, it came from somewhere. What is the source of that? Well, again, it has to be what we label as the Tao. The Tao must be the source for that as well. The, the Tao must be the mother of human consciousness, the human mind, human sentience as well. This is why we say sometimes in Tao cultivation, you might hear people say that our bodies came from the parents. But consciousness, you know, in terms of the mind, personality, the soul, if you will, that originated from the Tao. Let's continue on with the thought process of the ancients. So we did number one and two. Now we're going to do number three. So it, it wasn't just the animals. It wasn't just the living things or the human beings that were constantly changing, growing, developing. It was the world itself. They could observe changes that had nothing to do with animal growth. They could, for instance, see the change, the transition from one season to the next. Therefore, to them, it wasn't a strange idea at all to look at the world as a living thing. After all, it's also changing, it's also developing. Therefore, it must have been born because it's evidently going through stages or phases of growth and development. It too must have had a mother. If the world was alive, it too had a birth and a mother. And again, we will assign the label, the Tao, to it. Whatever it is, it is the source and driving force behind it all. Now, switching gears a little bit from ancient times to modern times. As we are assisted by our understanding, knowledge from science, we can see more, more evidence that the ancients were on the right track. So with the help of science, we see even more evidence of this idea. Here, I want to show you a graphic. So this is quite modern. It's a graphical sequence from UCLA in a course to explain deep geological time, the transformation of the earth through the different eras. And the concept is Pangea. Pangea is the supercontinent that the earth 
started out with 250 million years ago, the Permian Age. It has gone through consistent, continuous transformation very slowly through ecological time. So then after 50 years of transformation into the Triassic, we see some change. We see the supercontinent beginning to split apart. So scientists are quite confident that this was the case because they know about continental drift that's happening today. The continents are moving because the tectonic plates are moving, albeit very slowly. They can rewind to look at how it was in the past, and that's how they knew that 250 million years ago, we had Pangaea. As the time, as the clock continue forward, we got to the Jurassic, and this is all well before any human beings walk the earth. So the Jurassic age, 145 million years ago, even more split, and then the Cretaceous, 65 million years ago, it, beginning, it is beginning to resemble the world as we know it today. But notice that there's still connectedness between North America and what is today Northern Europe. And during that time, the connection between North and South America was submerged. Then at the bottom, you see present day, and that's the globe that we recognize. That is the world in which we travel. So then, obviously, it's not just the changing of seasons. The world is sort of like a person having gone through different stages of growth, having changed in the course of time and continuing to change, continuing to grow and develop. So in the distant future, tens, hundreds of millions of years from today, we can expect that the shape of the continents will look even a little more different than what we have today. So the world is one thing. And let me ask everyone to also think about turn the attention back to human beings again, but not individual human beings. I want to ask you to contemplate the growth of the human species. Think about the human species as one living thing that has also developed and changed over time. And I'll use this graphic here to represent that. So there's ample evidence for evolution uh, transitions having taken place. This is the representation of that. Well, what is the origin of that? What drives it? Again, the conclusion that we can have no difference from the ancients is the Tao and the virtue, the source, the origin, and the driving force. By virtue of the human species itself being a living thing, it's gonna change and grow and develop. So this is how modern thinking is compared and contrasted with ancient times. Now I think we're ready to talk about some additional concepts. And here's an important one. In line four, I wanna begin with the last character there. The pinyin, Z-I, so a native speaker might say Z, something like that, close enough, Z. What does it mean? Well, in the context of this chapter, it means children or offspring. The children of the mother is what it's saying. It's in that context, it is often used with another character, so here's an example, Haizi means child. So these are iterated characters, both characters mean child. So together 
it, it takes the contextual ambiguity away. So clearly it's talking about child and if plural, then children. Now that's when it is used in this context. I want to point out though, that this character is exactly the same uh, as another character that we use in a different context. In pinyin, it is zi. In the older Wei Giles romanization, tzu. I know people pronounce it like tzu sometimes, but it's actually tzu. Uh, whether, whatever romanization system you use, it's supposed to sound the same, like the original Chinese. And this is exactly the same as the second character of Laozi. And this is where a lot of people in the West are misled into thinking that, oh, well, Laozi, the first character means old. The second character means child, as you have here, children, offspring. So Laozi, old child. And I want to let everyone know that is not the case. That is actually wrong. In the context of Laozi, it means master or teacher. When it is used in that context, it can never mean child, not even a little bit. So I got one more slide to conclude this topic. Let me show you what it looks like. What are we looking at here? Well, I know you uh, uh, a lot of uh, people tuning in uh, don't really know Chinese. That's okay. Look at the English. You're gonna see familiar names. Laozi, Zhuangzi. Then we get to Confucius and Mencius. Let me explain the English a little bit. As I mentioned, Laozi is the Wade Giles Romanization. This is the system that started a um, hundred years ago, was used before World War II. And it was the system that became widespread and became popular until a newer system, the Pinyin, was invented and used by mainland China. So they're both depicting the same characters in the original. Laozi, Zhuangzi, uh, and then in Pinyin, you'll see the Z, the Zi there. So Laozi, Zhuangzi, they're supposed to sound the same. So just the romanization, the spelling that is different. Now, Confucius and Mencius are not Wei Giles romanization. These were the original names that was given to these ancient sages by the visiting European missionary in ancient China. When European missionaries first arrived in China, this was at a time historically, uh, as was the case through most of Chinese history, where uh, Confucian, Confucian teachings predominated. So when they arrived in China, the missionaries discovered that people were constantly quoting these sages, Kongzi, Mengzi, so they gave them names according to what they knew, which was Latin. So Confucius is a Latinized name of Kongzi, Mencius, a Latinized name of Mengzi. But that's the origin. So prior to standardization of the Pinyin system, these were being used sort of mix and match. So the original Laozi, Zhuangzi, Kongzi, Mengzi, you're gonna see when I lay it out like this, it's very evident, it's very obvious that the second character is the same for all of them. And it's translated the same way for all of them. And mostly the, the first character is the surname of the sage. Therefore, I think it makes sense for me to tell everyone that in ancient times, zi was often used as an honorary title. And as you see in the big title for the slide here, the meaning was master or teacher, like a spiritual master, master of teachings, the teacher.
honorary title. And when used this way, I think now it makes sense to you. It could never mean child. So when I say, when somebody says, Laozi means old child, that's wrong. It's old master or old teacher. If you buy into that misconception, and this is one of the most widespread misconceptions in the West, then you would also have to consider the possibility that Zhongzi was the Zhuang child. That's ridiculous. Kongzi, the Kong child, mentions the Mong child. It doesn't mean any of that. This is uh, extremely popular as a distortion of Laozi. And online, you can find all kinds of examples of the misconception. So I want to be very uh, emphatic when I say this. Uh, there is another one that you don't see here, uh, Sanzu Sunzi. It's always master. It's always an honorary title signifying great respect. Has no other meaning. It's not a clever pun. Some people think it is. It's not hidden humor. Again, there are people who think they're very clever to discover the hidden humor. No, that's not the case. It's not a paradox. No paradox here. Don't be looking for paradox where none exists. So online and in books, published books that are still in circulation, you see all kinds of mistakes. Some say, some authors say, Laozi literally means old, young, because, you know, child is young. Wrong. It doesn't mean that. Some say Laozi literally means the old man. Wrong. Zi is an honorary title. It doesn't mean man. Another person says Laozi literally means old seed, like the, the seed that you plant. And that's because Zi, the second character, combined with another character can mean seed. So again, that is wrong. These are all signs where the author really doesn't know much of if any Chinese at all, and therefore invents explanations without really knowing the original. Laozi is not the old fellow. Zi isn't fellow, it's master or teacher. Laozi is not old boy, Zi isn't boy. So I think I have pretty much talked about all the possibilities. I think this will be helpful that when you're out there looking at different material, you can assess the quality of the understanding of the translator just by looking for their contrived explanations that are erroneous about Laozi. Same with the other sages. So before leaving the slide, let me just uh, provide one thought, one remark, one opinion. Um, I like presenting information this way because it is so simple that anyone can look at this table and grasp the meaning immediately. Looking at a table like this, it makes it very obvious, super obvious, that all this stuff about Laozi being the old child or the old boy or the old son is simply wrong. Continue to the next slide. Let's talk, let's go back to the context of zi as children. So let's, uh, let's be clear. What are we talking about when we refer to the children of the mother, the mother being the Tao? It includes the world itself, as we have just talked about. Everything, and here I'm talking about living things as well as the non-living. Um, and if you wonder what I mean by the non-living, well, I can point to, you know, perhaps uh, a rock. You know, it's not something that grows like animals or plants, but it's among everything. I also want to include humans and human consciousness. We are, of course, part of everything. We're not apart from that. I'm just singling out humans because I'm biased being a human myself. I want to put a focus on the human beings, life, living things, 
because I am human and I am alive. I also want, want to put an emphasis on human consciousness because I think, therefore, I am. Now, Lao Tzu makes the point here is that when you understand the mother, which is the Tao, you understand the children, which is all of the above. So some examples, like you can apply the circular movements of the Tao universally. Lao Tzu has said that the movements of the Tao is the great circle. And he talked about this in a bunch of different ways. So we can apply the circle to all the children of the Tao. For instance, one of the insights is that while the world follows the patterns of the Tao because the Tao is embedded everywhere in nature, therefore, circular patterns like the changing of seasons and the transition of day to night back to day again, circular, and when we have more science to understand the world even better, we see the orbit of planets also circular. And when we limit ourselves to just the world, we see so many Tao principles that we can observe that can be applied to the children of the Tao. The softest overcome the hardest. Water dissolves rocks. Living things are pliant. Dead things are tough and brittle. Understanding the Tao allows us to understand living things, life and death. Understanding the Tao also helps us understand one another because we come from the Tao. There are certain things about us that are just the way we are. That is just the way human beings are. And when I say the way human beings are, I'm saying the Tao of humanity. We also go through cycles and phases in life. So we're not so different from nature, the changing of seasons. We talk about the seasons of life. And, you know, sometimes we even use the date night cycle to describe age. Think about when we refer to the twilight years of one's life. That's part of the, the date night cycle. And when we look at human interactions, the way we deal with one another, the way nations deal with one another, diplomacy and negotiations invariably turn out to be more useful, more beneficial than warfare and aggression. Why is that? Well, understanding Tao tells us that the soft overcomes the hard. Therefore, it is ultimately peace that will overcome violence. And it is the, when we deal with one another, when you think about your friends, the people that you depend on, your loved ones, it is always the intangibles that outweigh the tangibles. I mean, at the end of the day, the friendships, the connections, the relationships, these are intangible. And yet, they eventually, well, it will dawn on all of us that these are more important than the tangibles in life. And when I say tangibles, I'm talking about materialistic objects, things. Materialism. So these are all examples of applying the principles of the Tao to the children of the Tao. O only when we fully understand the Tao can we apply that understanding to everything all around us which are defined as the children of the Tao. Let's move on. So then uh, what well, we're talking about, everything that we have just talked about can be summarized like this. Understanding life, the world, and everything in it, they're all sourced in the Tao. And when we think about our own lives, your life, my life, what's in front of us, what's behind us, 
the life that we have lived, the life we have yet to live, it can be very helpful because, for instance, understanding the Tao may lead to the realization that many of our problems are self-inflicted. That is, we ourselves, being part of the Tao, would become the source of all the good things and all the bad things. And the bad things include problems, challenges, setbacks. That insight alone, that, hey, you, you may be the cause of your own problems, that insight can be the beginning of the solution. Now, when I say that, it seems rather obvious, but I'm here to tell you that I know many people who haven't quite arrived at this realization, this insight. I know people who are constantly dwelling on what happened in the past and then wanting to tell everybody, this is what happened to me, this is why my life is the way it is right now. Um, and you know, this was done to me and I don't get it. I don't understand why, why? Okay, well, this person has very little insight into how he or she has caused many of these problems, if not all of them. And therefore, for this person, there can be no beginning of the solution. And I'm talking about the people that I know in real life, there's more than one. It's rather common. Now for us, I hope that we have something different. I hope that Dow cultivation can help us change our lives. The way that it does that is not by telling us what to do. So remember, when we study the mystic virtue, a main point is that the Tao has, has given rise to us, has created us, nurtures us, and yet it doesn't seek to command us, dominate us. It doesn't seek to take credit. So the Tao cultivation can change us, but not by the Tao telling us what to do. The only way that we can transform our lives to you know change my life is through the clarity that we attain in Tao cultivation and never under, underestimate the power of clarity it is extremely powerful one insight one distinction one glimpse of clarity can irrevocably change one's life and more clarity can only be better Let's move on to line six. So still holding on to the mother, and by now you know this means holding on to the Tao. So the overall idea, I think uh, uh, you, you're gonna find to be very easy to follow. When you know your own nature as a child of the universe, uh, as some, some entity, as a, as the to you the most important entity of all connected to the Tao at the most fundamental level naturally you're going to want to hold on to that connection it can hardly be any other way the more you understand that the more strongly you want to hold on to that connection so let me talk about what holding on to the connection means holding on to the Tao holding on to the mother is to hold on to the Tao and this means Number one, hopefully what we're all doing, following your personal path of cultivation. That means, you know, the journey of a thousand miles. One step at a time, we're digging a well that will provide the water of spirituality, and we need to dig that well a little deeper every day. So that's first and foremost, Tao cultivation is number one. Number two is how we live day to day as we're cultivating. We need to relax, relax into the flow of everyday reality. Here, I want to be very clear that when I say relax into the flow, I don't mean let the flow of everyday reality push you around. That is a more passive mindset. What I always advise people is to recognize the flow, see what the flow is doing, and then use the flow for yourself. 
work with the flow so that you can take advantage of its power. But to relax into the flow, specifically, I'm talking about not dwelling on gain or loss, victory or defeat, railing against the way things are, expressing anger at why things are not the way you want it to be. So I know that we can all use a little bit of that, that relaxed mindset, that easy mindset going into the flow and then be able to work with the flow. And this is the reason why I uh, always, uh, I'm always careful when I say, uh, when I use an expression, like go with the flow, because I realize that it can lead to some misconceptions. Number three, turning the focus inward. This too is fundamental. This too is basic. Without benefit of spiritual instructions, many of us may be focusing externally to the world at large. And it's not a surprise because that's what we've all been taught as we were growing up. You know, we find out the world is instructing us that, you know, our purpose is to is to follow a set pattern. You know, there's schooling, there's getting a getting job or getting work, there's uh, you know, finding someone, start a family, etc. The instruction for from the external world is very externally oriented. It's all about your attainment in the material world wealth, recognition, fame, etc. The radical thinking from the Tao perspective is the other way. No, no, not the external focus, internal focus. Look inward. There are so many answers that we've been neglecting just because we haven't looked internally very much. And there's an infinity in the connection internally with the Tao, and it deserves our full attention. Lastly, external again, and that is our interactions with other people. We're all here for ourselves and for one another. It's easier to understand when we realize that fundamentally we're all connected to one another at the most fundamental level imaginable, which means in a real sense, we are one. Therefore, helping others is no different than helping ourselves. From that perspective, thinking about working with, assisting other entities, other human beings, is no different from number three, turning the focus inward and going from the powerful connection that we do have on that fundamental level. So let's move on to line seven. Live without danger all through life. So what I'm doing first is that I'm isolating the last character there, die. The meaning of that character is dangers. In this context, it's the, da the quote unquote dangers are all about the problems, the challenges, the setbacks that we encounter in life. Now, the other characters also deserve some attention. So I want to give you the breakdown uh, of meaning of the four characters. So we're gonna we're gonna see we're gonna see the second character, Sun repeatedly throughout this entire chapter. Uh, it can mean the body, one's self, or one's life. So the first character is to, to be without, to not have, to no longer have. And when you say you no longer have life, that's actually talking about the end of life. So when you have an expression here, the first two characters that say reaching the end of life, meaning death, 
it's actually an expression talking about all your life until the moment of death, your entire lifetime. So in your entire lifetime, then we have the last two characters. We talked about this one being danger. The third character means negation, not. So literally it says, you go through all your life until you die without danger, meaning without challenges or problems in life. So here's what it means. If you understand the Tao through everything, because everything is the children of the mother, which is the Tao, then you will naturally hold on to the mother, which is the Tao, and never have any problems until you leave this world, until the end of your life, meaning all your life, you're going to be living the easy Tao-centric life, one that is full of joy and grace and effortless excellence. So that's what Lao Tzu is trying to say. It's important to know the children and hold on to the mother. Now, he's going to be very specific on exactly how we can do that. And this is what we get into concept heavy part of the chapter. Prior to this, we're just establishing that the Tao is the mother and that the mother has children, which includes the world, all living things, human beings, human consciousness. Now we're about to get specific about life. So in line eight, the character to pay attention to is the last character, Dui. This one, we need to, I need to uh, kind of highlight because in the ancient context, it refers to the mouth. It is no longer used that way in modern times, this character. In modern times, it means exchange, like for instance, monetary exchange, currency exchange. So this, this stick with the ancient context for the time being, it's talking about the mouth. And this line says, close the mouth. These three characters. They say that, this line says that because ancient sages recognize the mouth is a major source of trouble in life. How so? Well, in a couple of different ways. The mouth is what we use for overconsumption, overindulgence of food. So the Chinese say that disease come in through the mouth, meaning overconsumption, overindulgence can lead to health problems. But going out, well, think about gossip, rumor, complaints, criticisms, all kinds of negativity. And you don't even have to get into negative, malicious remarks for the mouth to get you into a lot of trouble. Sometimes, you can mean something completely innocuous, and yet you get a very bad reaction. For that reason, the ancient sages would say it would be better to close the mouth, meaning it would be better to talk less or to say nothing. Now, there are stories in Chinese culture to explain this very point that oftentimes it's better to talk less or at a minimum, choosing what you say with great care. So I want to bring you a particular story just like that. The title of the story, as you can see, Choosing Words with Care. So here's how the story goes. Once upon a time in ancient China, there was a man he had a goal. He wanted to increase his influence in society. That meant he wanted to expand his social circle into high society, the nobles and the notables. So he decided that he was going to be the host of a lavish banquet, and he would invite the most distinguished members of society to be his guests. So on the night of the banquet, this man became increasingly anxious 
as the host. Why? Well, it turns out that it was almost time to start the banquet, but only about half of the guests that he had invited showed up. Only about half arrived. He was anxious because this was not looking very good and it would not look good for him if his banquet was half empty. So he paced back and forth. He's hoping for more people to arrive. And without thinking, he said to himself, what is happening? The people who should be here aren't here. Why? Now, unbeknownst to him, he did not realize his guests in the banquet hall heard him talking to himself. They could hear him clearly. Some of them thought, well, if the people who should be here aren't here, doesn't that mean the people who are here, like me, should not be here? Feeling insulted by this, they decided to depart quietly. After a moment, the host looked around and he suddenly noticed he had even less guests than before. Some of them had left. He panicked and he said, what now? The people who should leave have left. Why? Again, this was heard by his remaining guests. And they all thought, well, if the people who shouldn't leave have left, and I'm still here. Doesn't mean that I should leave. Is that what it's trying to say? So, like the previous group of people that had already left, they also decided they wanted to be somewhere else. So, most of the guests had all left, only one guest remained. It was a friend of his, a friend of the host. They both looked at the empty banquet hall and it was a most embarrassing sight. So the friends tried to console him. You really should think about what you're gonna say before you speak up, especially with this group of people, he said. You know, they're not as understanding as I am. I know you, but what you say to them, if it's something wrong, it can be really hard to take it back. So the friend thought that the host would thank him for this advice. Instead, the man wailed. He said, no, I didn't mean for them to leave, not them. His friend took offense at this. He said, coldly, I see. You did not mean for them to leave, so you meant for me to leave. Is that it? Very well. It shall be exactly as you wish. He turned angrily. He left without another word or a backward glance. So that is the story of what I call choosing words with care. It illustrates how the mouth can get us into trouble. So let me uh, see if I can highlight the points. This is all related to the line, close the mouth. Why close the mouth? Well, as you can see, because the mouth can be the source of misfortune. What we say can be the cause of disasters, even if you don't mean it, or your intentions are good. What we say can cause the opposite of what we intend. Because that is the case, when it comes to talking, oftentimes less is more. So you see, the more we think about it, the more the advice from Laozi makes sense. 
If you cannot keep your mouth shut, you're likely to create all kinds of problems for yourself. It would be better to say less or nothing at all. Now, I want to flip this around the other way and consider our interactions with other people. This is applying the story to us as we deal with others, as we talk to other people. Can we all be perfect in our communication? Probably not. So let me point this out. There's going to be some times, in fact, I think a lot of times, when we overthink what other people have said. They might have said something carelessly. They might have also, like the host in the story, said something without thinking. And nowadays, we would use an expression like, uh, oh, he said the quiet part out loud. He shouldn't have said that, but he did, right? And it can be humorous, as it was in this story. This happens, it's a part of life, it's something to be expected. So we can overthink what others have said. Now, the reminder for us is that, well, we too can be rather thoughtless in our expressions. And this is why I decided to give the story the title, Choosing Words with Care. And sometimes consider the possibility that not only less is more, but also perhaps silence is golden. That if I say nothing at all, I may actually improve my situation because for sure, if I say something that causes problems, I may be digging a hole deeper for myself. When that happens, the only cure, the only solution is to pause, is to stop digging. So with that, with the end of that story and our discussion thereof, I see that we are approaching the end of our time together today. So I don't want to go too much further into this chapter, but instead I want to bring up the summary. Today we have talked about how the Tao can be seen as the mother. So I want to hang on to that and, want, and I want to make that the focal point of our summary today. You can probably tell that there's a lot more that we can talk about with this topic you know, some of it humorous, some of it instructional, some of it as a warning to our lives. I'm very looking forward to that, you know, in our next discussion. For now, let me use this as a summary. What you see here, the Tao is the mother of everything. On the right-hand side, you're going to see some Chinese characters. Tian Xia, that means all under heaven or the world. And then we have one Wu, that means 10,000 things, or more specifically, the myriad things, all things, everything. And then at the bottom, Zhen, that's human beings, that's you and me. So the Tao is the mother of everything, includes all of that. Therefore, in summary form, I would point out the world is a child of the Tao just like you and me, the world originating from the Tao is sacred. Again, just like you and me, the world has a sacred journey. It's going through growth, changes, development, just like you and me. We have an obligation toward the world just as we have an obligation toward our own destiny. Then, Let's also not forget the myriad of things. All living things partake in the Tao, just as we do. They have their own connection to the Tao. It's a different kind of connection than our connection, but they have their connection nonetheless. Therefore, extend our circle of compassion. Think about pets, how we love them. What we have done there is that we have extended our circle of compassion 
from friends, family, loved ones to pets. We regard them as a member of our inner circle. They're like family to us. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. My encouragement is for everyone to consider extending that circle of compassion even more. Think about all the creatures out there, great and small. How different are they from the pets that we love? Which ones among them can we not be friends with? I got to say, animals are cool. When you cultivate the Tao to a certain point, when you have extended your circle of compassion, one thing you will realize is that magically, animals will sense the change in you. Suddenly, they are much more receptive to you. They become unafraid of you. So I want to imply, I want to apply that not just to the pets, the dogs and cats that we're familiar with, but to greater and greater circle of compassion that includes more and more animals. I gotta say again, animals are cool. Love them. Lastly, human beings. Here, as you have heard me talk about, I'm not just talking about physical bodies, but human consciousness, the mind, human sentience, the soul, if you will. If you don't believe in the soul, then try my concept of the true self. So we come from the Tao. We must eventually return to it. Between now and that great return, there is a lot of room for us to do a lot of good, for us to be together, learn together, and help one another. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.